This is a production of Cornell University. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second tree hand webinar series. Um, my name is Luis Monserrate. I'm a second year PhD student in plant breeding and genetics at Cornell University in Larry Smart's lab. And once again, I'm accompanied by Colonel Alan Tommy, Tony, sorry, Baracco, who has assisted me with this uh, webinar uh, in this past, what, what is it going to be like four sessions right now? Uh, I would like to mention again that the, the, this webinar series is a component of a larger project called a, well, which is a development of a educational curriculum or modules, sorry, sorry that will be free available on the Cornell HEM website at the end of the webinar series. And each mod module, excuse me, each module will consist of a recorded webinar, an instructional slide deck, and a set of high impact papers pertaining to the respective subject. All webinars will be uh, recorded and available on the Cornell SIPS YouTube channel if you're interested in rewatching them or sharing them with somebody else. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Heather Darby. She's a professor of agronomy at the University of Vermont. And she has hosted a very nice hemp home conference two weeks ago. And today she's gonna to talk about her experiences growing high cannabis hemp in the Northeastern US. So very excited about this and to hear more about it. So without further ado, please Dr. Darby, take it away. All right. Well, great. Thanks, everyone, for joining today. And um, as already mentioned, I'm, I've been working on hemp here in Vermont, which is in the northeastern part of the United States. If you're not familiar where Vermont is, it's, it's actually right next to New York. And it's a small state. Um, but very beautiful. And we have been able to research hemp since 2015, uh, once we were able to receive a permit from the US government. So our research has been sort of developing um, over that time. And I'll also say part of what we do at the University of Vermont is also work with growers. So we're not only re like conducting research, but the research that we do, we want it to be very applied and practical and readily available to the farmers that we're trying to help. So for, for most uh, people that are growing hemp, it is a new crop and it's also been really a new crop to researchers. So there's quite a bit to learn. I've learned a lot myself over the past six years now that we've been doing this. And I just want to share some of that with you today, just experiences and, and also research. OK, so let's start with soil. So everything if you're growing outside, of course, and even if you're not, if you're growing um, inside the growing media or um, if you're outside, of course, the soil is obviously where we need to start. It's going to really in a lot of ways make or break um, the overall productivity of your operation. So if you're buying a farm, buying land, um, it's definitely something you wanna pay a lot of attention to um, if you don't own land yet. But if you own land, you really want to uh, focus on what you have and um, really make the soil so that it is highly conducive for adequate crop so we hear a lot about hemp being widely, widely adapted to many climates, which is really true. Um, but in regards to soil, um, it does require the highest, really the highest quality soil to, for the plant to be the most productive. So a soil that has really good physical properties and good soil health, and I'll explain a little bit more about this. Now, one of, um, the primary sort of limitations that I've seen in growing hemp is that hemp doesn't really like wet feet, especially when it's small, when you first plant it, um, or if you're transplanting, when you first put those transplants in the ground. Once it's established, it can definitely tolerate um, wetter soils, but in its initial phases of establishment, it's really difficult to get a good stand of hemp if you have very, very wet soils and poorly drained soils. 
Um, generally, we find that if you have 40% or more uh, clay content in your soil, it's going to be difficult probably to grow most any crop. But um, why did it do that? Uh, but it's especially difficult to get hemp established. And of course, there are a lot of opportunities if you have clay soil to basically create better structure and drainage and also possibly to use subsurface drainage or tile to assist with creating an environment that will be conducive for hemp production. And I'll, I'll say the, the other piece here is, I guess, take a soil test. Right? If you're gonna call a university system and ask an extension person what you should do to your soil, probably the first thing they're gonna say to you is, do you have a soil test? So get out and take a soil test. A standard soil test is cheap. Um, usually they cost anywhere from 15 to maybe 20 or $25. Most university systems um, will provide soil test services in New York. Um, that's through a private lab in Vermont, it's through the university. So contact um, your university extension to figure that out, where you would send those, but it's, it's worth the uh, 15 or $20 so that you can address any underlying issues, um, especially from a fertility perspective that the soil might have. So pH is probably the first thing to look at and hemp does require a pH over six. And um, at least in the Northeast and other parts of the world as well, uh, the soil pH generally either is below seven and sometimes well below, like it can be here in the Northeast. And then in other parts of the country or the world, sometimes the pH is well over seven, sometimes eight. Um, and both ends of that spectrum can create some productivity issues. So again, you wanna to try to adjust that soil pH to be right around or over six. So ideally about 6.5 to 6.8, so slightly acidic. All right, there we go. So fertility requirements of hemp um, are known. So we know what hemp has in its plant composition. If we took the plant and ground it up, we would see um, what nutrients are in it and, and sort of what the composition is. And what we know less about for growing hemp at this point are, you know, nutrient requirements based on each individual's kind of soil type or climate. And that type of information takes years to develop. And because we've only had, you know, a short period of time, at least at the university system, growing hemp in the last 50 to 100 years, we don't have the best soil recommendations we could have like we do for other crops. But we do have, you know, um, I would say well-educated guesses around what we feel people need to be doing to grow a high quality stand of hemp. So we know that hemp requires in, in good amounts nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. These are the macronutrients. So we know that hemp um, is generally composed of about three to 4% nitrogen. So it utilizes a lot of nitrogen, just like most crops. Um, two to 3% potassium. So again, it requires um, high levels of potassium. And for phosphorus, it requires much less um, to grow adequately. And it's about a half a percent. Um, to about 0.6%. So if you look at these kind of ratios, you can see that that crop is gonna require far more nitrogen and potassium than it will phosphorus. So in general, at least in Vermont, um, for potassium and phosphorus, based on our soil tests that we've received from hemp growers, uh, we're usually looking at about a 60 to 70 pound uh, recommendation per acre for both potassium and phosphorus. But again, that's highly dependent on a soil test. So we want to account for what's already in your soil before we tell you to put on more nutrients. But again, you can see in general, your crop is going to require a lot of nitrogen, a good amount of potassium, and a much smaller amount of phosphorus. It's really important for folks to understand that 
there are essential nutrients to growing crops. Um, and even though the, we call these macronutrients and you need them in relatively higher percentages, it doesn't mean that you know, adding nitrogen and not adding phosphorus is what you should do. If your soil test comes back saying that you're low um, in phosphorus and you're high in potassium and nitrogen, but you don't add the phosphorus, you're still gonna have pro production limitations in both quality um, and also yields, okay? So it's important to take that soil test and understand um, you know, the baseline fertility of the soil before you just start adding things, okay? Because adding too much nutrients or not enough can provide, um, cause a lot of challenges as the crop is grown. All right, so there's a lot of information about nitrogen fertility and hemp in the gray um, literature, I guess. So we do see a lot of information out there um, and it's kind of hard to sort through what's, you know, been sort of scientifically researched and what hasn't. But from my own experiences working with farmers and the research that we've done, we have seen, and this also is supported in the literature, that if you put on too much nitrogen, too high a rate, um, it does stimulate the formation of male flowers. And I haven't seen this in hemp being grown for uh, CBD or even THC. Where I've seen this is in grain, grain hemp, <laughs> actually, where I've seen a lot of hermaphrodites um, being produced when we've done nitrogen studies and put on rates that are well over 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So again, too much nitrogen can lead to other problems. Uh, split applications of nitrogen are the best. That is going to minimize overfeeding at any one single stage, but also minimize uh, the potential for loss, right? So if you put all that nitrogen fertility on, before you even plant, um, it's at risk of loss into the environment. And, you know, fertilizers are expensive. So we don't want to do that. All right. So deficiency of nitrogen in hemp uh, causes the entire plant to turn yellow and look very chlorotic. And um, it's really hard to bring those plants back, I have found. So really have your fertility strategy honed in and ready to go before you put the plants in the ground. Um, because once those plants get really stressed, it feels often impossible to bring them back, all right? So how much nitrogen are we talking about? And we have done some studies um, here in Vermont in collaboration with um, the University of Maine as well. And really what we have kind of found is that fertilizing um, hemp being grown for um, CBD or flour um, or cannabinoids really does require about, you know, anywhere from 100 up to about 125 pounds of nitrogen. So what that means is that the plant is going to take up that much nitrogen. That does not necessarily mean that you need to apply that much nitrogen to the soil. So here, this is showing percent nitrogen concentration. And you can see at 125 pounds of nitrogen, we maxed out the percent of N in the actual plant. Um, and that's what we're really trying to understand because we know that the hemp is only really going to take up three to 4% of its total biomass in nitrogen. So we're trying to figure out when does that plateau? How much do we actually need to add um, to supply the plant with what it needs? So this is um, our nitrogen research results from this year in Vermont. And you can see we applied zero pounds of nitrogen, 50 pounds of nitrogen, 100, 150, and 200. 
And these were split applications. So we didn't apply it all at once, like I already mentioned. We split these up over three times, part of the nitrogen going on before we planted, part of the nitrogen going on about two weeks after we planted, and an additional amount of nitrogen going on about four to five weeks after we planted. And you can see that when we hit about 100 pounds of nitrogen added, um, we maximized flower yield at a little over four pounds per plant, okay? But we also, if you look at this orange line, um, the percentage of flower out of the whole total biomass went down, which is really interesting which means the plant is actually also producing a lot more leaves and stems. Um, so it's taking that nitrogen and it's building biomass. And some of that biomass is flower, but some of the biomass that's being produced is also more leaves, more stems, et cetera. But again, as I mentioned, really this, about 100, anywhere between 100 and then about 125 is where we're seeing a maximum response. And again, you know, this is, it's complicated because um, it really is dependent on how you've treated your soil in the past um, to determine how much additional nitrogen you need to add. But in general, if you're starting really at ground zero, this is what we're finding as optimum. All right. So, you know, there's been a lot of question as well around if we increase nitrogen rates, are we going to see spikes in THC and CBD? Um, and this, there's a lot of, has been a lot of debate about this in, again, in the gray uh, literature where you, know, you hear a lot about if you add too much nitrogen, the THC levels are gonna go up. And if you don't add enough, the THC levels are gonna go up. We have not experienced that. We have been conducting these studies now since 2018, looking at fertility rates um, in uh, hemp being grown for cannabinoids and you know, up to about 200 pounds of nitrogen being applied, we have not seen a spike in THC, which is what this data is showing, this lower bar. You can see that there's no, there has been no difference. Um, we also really haven't seen a difference in total um, cannabinoids either. Right. Um, so, Fertility, very important. Start with a soil test. If you don't know how to read it, reach out to somebody, usually at the university system. There's also lots of private crop consultants. There is information on the internet too, but make sure you're going to a reputable source. We have a website, Cornell has a website, um, so that you're making good decisions around fertility management. Um, here's a picture of some hemp, doesn't look so great. This hemp here is actually stressed out from its soil condition. And again, when you're growing hemp, if it's starting out like this, it becomes very difficult to get it back on track. So starting out by doing your homework, you know, preparing the land properly um, is gonna go a long, a long way into um, success on your farm. So hemp does have uh, a relatively long taproot. If the soil is friable, can go up to six feet down into the ground, um, especially if you have really good soil quality that I mentioned before. So the soil is very friable, maybe even it's a lighter textured soil, um, but soil condition does really impact the, the depth uh, and rooting system of hemp. And it does in other crops too but hemp can be very um, efficient at securing nutrients, especially deeper down into the soil profile if you create um, a good um, soil environment. So 
It also allows the plant to access water, um, which it may not be able to otherwise access if the rooting system is so again, just giving um, the hemp a really great soil environment will help the plant become more productive. All right, I have a feeling this is just gonna end up being a soil talk, <laughs> which is important as I've already said, um, and there's a lot to say about it. So we'll um, keep going down this, this line, I'm sure um, there'll be a lot of questions as well. So again, there's potassium and phosphorus as well. Um, needing a little bit less, but still really important nutrients. Um, we do know that hemp uses most of its phosphorus at flowering, so more so than during the vegetative phase. So you want to make sure that um, the phosphorus itself is added, not necessarily at flowering, um, I would actually say that adding phosphorus earlier, like even pre-plant is, um, works out really well because you don't necessarily lose phosphorus from leaching in the soil. And depending on the source of phosphorus, it might take a little bit for it to break down or make its way to the plant. So you just wanna make sure that that phosphorus is available at flowering. Make sure the pH again is over six because if you have a really low or really high pH, it actually will tie up phosphorus, okay? So again, most of the phosphorus is used during flowering and you'll wanna make sure that you get that on early enough um, in the season so that it is available to the plant at that time. If you're looking at your soil tests, usually soil tests will say, um, you know, if the amount of phosphorus or potassium, let's say, is adequate or optimum. And that's really your indicator if you don't know much about soil tests um, and soil test reports that you have enough, okay? So if you're um, optimum in phosphorus on the soil tests or even high, you definitely don't have to add any more. Okay, so with potassium, you need to be a little bit careful with potassium. It's, it's very soluble. It's readily available. It also can leach very easily. Um, and the, re the requirement of hemp for potassium is highest um, about four weeks after germination. So kind of um, in that where we start to move into kind of the rapid uh, growth phase of hemp. And you, again, would want to put the potassium on relatively early. If you need a lot of it, you might wanna do a, like a, a split application and a lot means you need 100 pounds or even 150 pounds. It really will depend on your soil test. Um, you'll wanna do a split application a little bit, about half, I guess not a little bit, half at planting and then you know the other half a uh, couple of weeks after but you really wanna make sure that it's on the ground um, and ready for the plant in the vegetative phase. Um, we have seen this where there's too much potassium, especially around flowering or late in the season, and it can really delay um, maturity. And that's in all crops, you know, it's not just hemp. All right, so micronutrient fertility. Now we hear a lot about this in hemp, people adding all kinds of concoctions, um, trying to, you know, add this micronutrient and that micronutrient. Um, so if you're growing in what we call soilless media, so that would be, you know, how you would be growing in a greenhouse, um, or, you know, I guess maybe if you're growing even hydroponically, then of course it makes sense to add a micronutrient pack to that mix because soilless media has usually has nothing in it unless you bought it with nutrients. Um, out in the field, again, really important to get a soil test here because micronutrients are, um, are required and they're essential. But if you put on too much, you can kill your plants. <laughs> you know, they, you don't need very much. So with nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, we're talking 50, 60, 100, 150 pounds per acre. 
with micronutrients, you're talking a pound, an acre, a half a pound, um, a quarter pound, okay? So very, very, very small quantities. And if you put on too much, again, it can be, um, it can be detrimental to the plants in more ways than one. Hemp itself has a very strong requirement for magnesium. So you wanna make sure you look at your magnesium on a soil test and also for boron. So boron is deficient in our um, part of the United States. So I do recommend that growers apply boron um, to their soils with their other fertility program at about a pound to two pounds per acre. But again, that's very specific to Vermont. Um, and so a soil test in your area is gonna help you define what you need. Um, okay. So let's move on to um, varieties. And I'm sure somebody in this course probably has gotten into this um, in depth, but in my experience, um, purchasing seed, you know, it's, get, it's gotten a lot better than it was when I first started, but um, you know, it still is kind of a little bit buyer beware. You wanna make sure you're buying from a reputable company Companies now, some of the better companies um, and more reputable have been around for quite a while, um, have been around since 2015, 2016, and have an established business and an established clientele. Um, they have a good reputation. So you wanna make sure that you're buying from a reputable um, seed source. And even though you know any seed person, salesperson, can give you a certificate of analysis. It doesn't really mean a whole lot, um, you know. As as folks, at least in the United States, know, um, you know, your crop is getting tested, and even though any seed company can probably show that they were in compliance, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the crop is always going to be compliant. So again, just buying from a reputable seed company is is really really important. Um, seed quality still seems to be all over the board. And, um, you know, again, reputable companies that can provide uh, germination rates and have been in business for a while are those that certainly I would recommend. Um, compliance is an issue, you know, especially if you're growing for cannabinoids and not um, high THC and you're trying to meet regulations, you have to um, make sure that you're growing varieties that are gonna be able to do that. And they're all over the board. So looking at independent variety evaluation trials, like the ones we have at UVM and Cornell has and others is important. Um, and again, looking at uh, reputable companies. And here's you know information from our variety trials. Um, this is just one year out of many of the years that we've done these trials. You know, there are varieties every year that are not compliant and, you know, we have to destroy them. Um, I think, again, this is getting better as we understand genetics um, and better varieties are being developed and released. And those companies that are reputable um, are still in business and those that are not uh, tend to make their way um, out of business. So again, uh, we offer a uh, variety information. Again, it may be specific to, you know, our region, but many of these varieties we're getting across the country, much of the seed from different companies. So the information is there. You can see that obviously they differ widely in flower production, but they also differ widely in CBD or other cannabinoid production as well, CBD, et cetera. So here's um, from our 2021 trial. Um, yeah, 2021, we haven't finished 2022 yet. And you can see the difference in yields uh, with the different varieties. Again, this information is available on our website, which I'll put up here in a second. And so you can get a chance to look at um, different varieties that are widely available and how they and here's uh, the cannabinoid data. Here's our website. I can put that in the chat afterwards. 
we post all of our data. It's available every year. Um, one of the things that we look at in our trials, which takes more time and effort, but I think if you're harvesting by hand, <laughs> and even if you're not, this is information that's become really important to us. And it's looking at the flower to other plant material ratio. Um, you know, if you're harvesting by hand and you have a plant that looks impressive, you know, it weighs 50 pounds and it, you can barely get your arms around it. It's great for photo ops, you know, and to send your friends and show them how big your hemp plant was. But when you <clears throat> start breaking that plant down and harvesting it by hand and end up with, you know, a pound of flour and about 50 pounds of leaves and stems, you'll realize it's not so cool. <laughs> you know, you're, you're almost crying because you just, you know, can't get through all the leaves. So what we've really been looking at is leaf to um, bud weight. Um, and, you know, it's really interesting. There are varieties that have far more uh, flower buds than they do leaves and or stems. And it makes it much easier to harvest, especially if you're um, hand harvesting. But, you know, depending on what market you're going for. If you're going for, you know, the smokable market or biomass, these this kind of information becomes um, much more important. So again, this is all on our website and you can clearly see there's, there's strong differences. You know, you can look down here at the bottom where, you know, almost 30% um, of the plant material was uh, flower for this bottom variety and 70% was, uh, not 70%, um, another 40% was, was leaf weight and the rest was stems, right? So we want varieties, at least for what we're doing up here in the top, where the majority of the plant is flower bud. For most people, not everybody, that's what's being sold and has the highest levels um, of cannabinoid concentration. So here's just a little bit of data. Again, this is from 2020. A variety like Lifter, as an example, is 45% flower and 25% leaf. And on the low end, we had a variety called Anna Lee that was 19% flower and 47% leaf. So again, this kind of information is uh, helpful for, for growers um, and probably for breeders as well, I would assume. All right. So um, Getting the plants in the ground and started, we've done a lot of this. We, we, um, we've done direct seeding. We've also done clones and we've done um, transplants, seedling tra transplants from seed. Most now of what we do are um, transplants direct from seed. We've stopped doing clonal cuttings. Um, I think that works for some people, but a lot more labor experience needed, um, time, et cetera. To do that, uh, we can get really good plants started in the greenhouse. It takes about a month um, to do it, so not very long, and you have to be cautious and watch closely because they can quickly um, become overgrown. And when they become overgrown and leggy, um, that leads to difficulties with transplanting and establishment. So we use deep, deep cell trays to get more roots um, we blow fans on the plants after um, they come up, try to make those stems a little bit sturdier. You know, you're trying to pack a lot of plants in if you're planting acres and acres, but when those plants are, you know, closer together in these cells and they have less room and they start to touch, that's when they become elongated. So, you know, there's lots of ways to try to space things out and make more, um, you know, robust, a little bit shorter plants for transplanting. And those are just a few of the things that we've done using deep 72s. I prefer deep 50s um, to be able to get, you know, the best plants. And, and one month, it's not very long. So, you know, you got to plan for field delays um, as well. And, and this can happen in a wet year where or a cold year, you know, where, uh, plants can end up being in the greenhouse sometimes three weeks longer than you had planned. So these are all considerations if you're starting from transplant. We have done from seed as well, um, especially um, 
nor day neutrals we've done um, from seed. And, you know, this is tricky. <laughs> we, we have had good, good germ and really bad germ doing this. Um, and soil, soil health is, is sort of at the bottom of this. You can see we planted twice um, the day neutral varieties and, or, and um, you can see when we planted in June, we only had 47% germ. We had a huge rainstorm. The soil got really crusted and compacted, which is what happened. It was in a poor part of the field, poor part of the farm. Soil quality was, was low. Um, and we saw the results of that. And we planted a second planting, you know, at the end of July and um, saw much better germ, but we had better soil conditions. So if you are planting from seed, uh, be very cautious about where you're putting the hemp because it is very, very sensitive to um, soil quality as it's emerging and getting started. All right, so transplanting hemp. You know, people may or may not have experience with this. There's a lot of ways to do it by hand. Um, we do this mostly, again, you, you have to be careful and patient and um, good plants from coming out of the greenhouse work the best if they're too leggy and thin um, or the roots aren't that great. It's just gonna be hard to uh, put them in the ground and for them to survive. You know, if you're using a transplanter, you know, like the one here, um, you know, same kind of thing. You're just really looking for stout, robust plants to put in the ground to have the best success. These these are perfect, really, in my opinion. Uh, perfect size. These being a little bit long have some challenges there. You'll have more loss. You know, you get a wind, it'll kind of just break right off. Um, we have done a little bit with no-till into uh, like rolled and crimped rye would say it's possible, but we're still kind of working out the details of this um, and need some more, more time before we show you any results. A lot of people are still using plastic mulch. I think that's fine. Plastic mulch um, has a lot of benefits, especially <clears throat> if you're in a cold area like we are here in Vermont, um, but requires more equipment, requires plastic, um, and you know not only is you know most plastics not a renewable resource but you also have to get rid of that plastic after the season is over and where are you going to put it <coughs> you know probably in the landfill <coughs> so there's some sustainability you know questions around mulch um there are biodegradable mulches and things like that um, and again they all work well uh, and they have a lot of benefits, but you know, hemp can grow just as well without um, plastic mulch. Maybe even better, to be honest. Um, you know, if you are growing in plastic mulch and raised beds, you got to get you got to have irrigation as well, because you got to get water uh, through the plastic mulch, and so that's a whole nother piece of management. Um, going to grow hemp because then you have to have irrigation, you have to have the setup for irrigation and uh, be able to, to water those plants under that plastic. All right, just another picture of transplanters, people transplanting hemp. That's how a lot of people are doing it. You can see the scale here, lots of plastic. And again, uh, works well, but also not necessary, um, you know, Without plastic, you got less input cost, um, but you have other challenges, you know, bare ground, erosion, uh, weeds, disease, all those things. So you can grow without plastic and the plants can grow really well. If you have natural rainfall, you know, you likely get enough rainfall to grow a, a really good robust plant in most years, so you may not have to invest in irrigation, but um, you know, it, you can have success both ways. Um, plant spacing, it's been a lot of debate over this uh, over the last few years. Uh, you can plant hemp close together in our uh, day neutral varieties. We do two by two. 
uh, two feet by two feet. And, you know, some people use a spacing of one foot by one foot. Um, in our full season sort of photo period sensitive plants, we are still using four by four feet um, or five by five feet for the most part. But people have looked at everything in between. And again, there are benefits um, to any any plant spacing, it really depends on your environment and what you want to accomplish, how you're harvesting, um, what your end market is. But, you know, you can see we get higher yields with one by one because there's a lot more plants packed into an acre, but it's also a lot bigger investment in seed um, for that return. And again, you know, it's also a lot more plants to harvest, uh, potentially more disease. So you can see the unmarketable yield that's there. So again, it really depends on your goals for your business, what you're trying to do, uh, the equipment you have, whether you want to pack those plants in there or, you know, space them out far apart. Um, we do see a, a difference as well in um, CBD, pr or um, I'm sorry, we don't see any difference in CBD production um, based on plant spacing, but we do see the yield difference. Okay, um, let's see here. If we're looking at per plant yields, I'm sure this makes sense, right, um, with more span with more spacing, each individual plant yields much more, um, but there's more plants per acre with a one by one spacing, right? So this is per acre yields, and this is per plant yields. So if you're going for a high-end smokable market, you certainly wanna focus on you know, this wider plant. Um, the benefit to a wider plant spacing also we found or a slight benefit is that we get more bud um, and less leaves, which is a really good benefit. <laughs> um, and with a sh shorter plant spacing, closer plant spacing, we get more disease as we get older. All right, planning date. And again, we're, we're running short on time. So we'll kind of wrap up, I think, with a, a couple of last items. Uh, planning date here is, at least in Vermont, we're looking at optimizing planning dates around the beginning of June, okay? Um, you can get decent yields if you extend that planning date uh, into mid to end of June. You can still get yields. I hear that from a lot of people. But maximum yields we get here if we plant by the beginning of and these are from transplants that are about a month old. And you can also see probably the biggest difference and maybe the most important thing is with that longer um, growth period, we get higher levels of uh, CBD and other cannabinoids, quite a bit higher than delaying the planting date until the end of June, right? Because these plants have a longer period of time to be able to maximize flower quality. All right, so I know that um, we need to wrap up by about quarter of 10 of three and we're almost there. So I'll just talk a little bit about irrigation and drought resistance. We do know that hemp can be resistant to drought once it's established. So I want people to remember that you gotta get the crop out of the ground or you need to get those transplants established. And you saw the root system. That's how it can be so drought resistant. Um, so you need to have a you need to have soil conditions that allow for maximum root exploration to be able to provide the hemp with that sort of level of drought resistance. Because really the hemp itself does actually require for maximum productivity about 20 to 30 inches of rainfall. So it does need abundant moisture, especially early on in its growth. You know, once we get to flowering, um, the need for water, like most crops, um, as flower set starts to go down. So, you know, as far as irrigation goes, 
um, you know, it's not necessary depending on where you live, but it can be super helpful for establishment of the crop um, in particular. But, you know, you also have to be careful not to overwater because irrigation, too much water can lead to rots, which can seep here and other diseases. So we have seen a benefit with timely irrigation to yield. Um, versus just rain fed here in the Northeast. But again, um, it's not necessarily, we can still obtain decent yields in most every year without it, but it can be helpful to have irrigation available, especially in a dry year or to get the crops established. All right, the last thing I'll note is on cover crops because I get a lot of questions around uh, utilizing cover crops. If, if you have plastic, mulch or even if you don't, there's lots of opportunities to enhance soil health um, in your hemp. And we have grown all kinds of cover crops between our hemp rows over the years um, that we've been doing this. And you know, cover crops can establish very nicely, especially when you have a five by five um, setup or three feet by three feet, four by four feet. Um, and you can get a really good cover in between those rows um, if you want. And there's lots of options. I think, you know, one take home message uh, we can end on is you want to make sure you have good airflow. So you don't want to be growing some massive, high, tall, dense cover crop necessarily, because that's going to impede uh, airflow. Um, you want to be a little bit cautious about uh, certain uh, cover crops that might attract pests that you don't want on your hemp um, or diseases. So you want to be cautious about that. Uh, we have actually found a cover crop of annual ryegrass mixed with uh, low growing uh, white clover and uh, tillage radish works very nicely for us. But again, there's a lot of options here to improve soil health um, and reduce weed pests. So I think with that, um, we will end and take some questions here. I wanna make sure we have some time for, for questions. Um, <clears throat> and I see there's questions. I'll start with the ones in the Q&A since um, that's where we're supposed to put our questions. Um, all right, so is there a soil mix that we can make at home for starting seed indoors? Well, that's a really good question. I ha I don't start my own mix. Um, I rely on others <laughs> to do that for me. Um, you just want to make sure that, um, and I, I caution people of this because people will buy potting mixes that sound really great, but um, don't have enough fertility in them actually even grow a plant for a month. So you just want to make sure that you have, um, there, and there's a lot of potting mixes out there that are blended now just for hemp that uh, would be good to start with. But you know, you want to buy something that does have fertility in it. It's not just peat moss or even um, really overly sort of composted materials. But I would, yeah, I, I haven't made my own. Um, what is the re recommended N pounds per acre? So I did go over that a little bit. Um, really, I think for most people, if you're starting with a soil that has low organic matter, and again, this is why you need a soil test. If you have one to 2% organic matter and you haven't added any compost or other organic amendments, um, likely you're going to need about 100 to 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre, okay? But if you have a very fertile, fertile soil with lots, um, you know, you've been adding compost year after year after year, it's likely you would need very little, maybe 50 pounds. So it really depends on where you're starting. Um, what about nitrogen rate uh, for fiber? We have done those. and I would say the so far what we have seen is um, nitrogen recommendations for all of the hemp crops are about the same. Uh, we have done trials in grain fiber and in 
uh, for flour, and they are coming out about the same. You know, that sort of 100 to 125 pounds. If you have an organic matter level of about three to four percent, which is what we have. Okay. Um, did we use urea? No, we didn't use urea. Um, it depended on the year, but we did use um, a synthetic nitrogen source. And the reason we did that is because we wanted to know that we were getting exactly what we thought we were putting on. And I know there's questions around you know, worm castings, compost. But when you're doing a nitrogen trial, you wanna make sure if you're putting on 150 pounds of nitrogen, that is all available to the plant. Um, what did we put on a, at each application? It really depended on the treatment, but uh, we generally start with about 50 pounds pre-plant of actual N, and then we would add from there. Okay. Uh, are we talking about cannabis being grown for cannabinoids, fibers, or biomass. So all the data I showed you today was for cannabinoids, okay? Um, yes, and we, had, we haven't seen an increase. So I'm sorry, I'm supposed to be saying these questions. I apologize. Somebody is asking about the scientific reason for increased number of male plants under high end rates. Um, Usually when we see males being expressed or any kind uh, often of kind of these abnormalities, um, it usually has to do with some kind of stress on the plant. So I don't have a good scientific explanation uh, for that, but I would say that um, it, it likely is, is some kind of indicator of stress and you know the plant wanting to reproduce and make seed it's really probably what it comes down to how much sulfur does hemp plant seed and should sulfur be put down up front so sulfur does leach so it's another nutrient that we have to be careful about when we apply it um, using a sulfur based uh, complete fertilizer can be really helpful. So you can use, if you need potassium, sulfur, and magnesium, all critical in hemp production, you can use um, fertilizers like SOPOMAG, which is also approved for use in organic. And uh, generally about 25 to 50 pounds of sulfur is uh, what is required. But again, soil test. Do we harvest varieties early to be compliant with the THC percent? Um, yes, we actually track um, THC and CBD um, starting for us anyway, about um, three weeks after flowering starts so that we can, you know, figure out if we're moving out of compliance. So. You know, we are at a university, so um, we have a little bit more leniency in our work. And part of what we're trying to do is figure out, um, you know, when when crops and varieties can exceed that level. Um, but yes, I mean, we have had to destroy crops because they've they've gone above the allowable level. And um, I think everybody knows that THC and CBD, you know, they go up together. Um, if CBD is going up, so isn't THC. So um, maximizing one also means that you've likely, you may not have maximized THC, but it, you know, the longer you wait, the higher both levels are going to get to a point. So again, look at our research data. You can see, see those maximum levels for many of the varieties. Um, is that it? No. Lewis, is there anything you need to cover or do we just keep going? Um, if you have the time, we can cover the yeah. remaining questions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So have we looked at nutritional requirements for day neutral varieties versus full term? Um, we have not specifically uh, compared nitrogen rates for day neutral varieties. 
Um, I this I'm making a, an assumption, um, but it's likely the same. Um, and I say that because, you know, they the plants will require they may be smaller, but there's generally more of them. And um, you will want to fertilize for the additional plants, if that makes sense. So the recommended rate is is probably about the same. I wouldn't think that it would be less. Okay. Um, let's see here. Uh, I, I did answer the, this question with the larger spacing, so the five by five, did we notice a difference in overall cannabinoids? Um, we did not see a difference in the cannabinoid levels between the plant spacings, but there was a yield difference. Um, all right. Um, my other question is whether you have ever observed increased male plants under drought stress. Uh, we, so we get a decent amount of natural rainfall in Vermont and what we often consider dry by Vermont standards is certainly not a drought by any means for the most part. So I have not, I can't say that I have observed even in our driest years in Vermont, which we've had a few growing hemp, more males. I have not seen that. Um, are our research plots without plastic mulch? Some of them are and some of them aren't. So our plant, plant spacing study was without mulch. Our fertility studies are without mulch. The variety evaluation is on black plastic mulch. So usually um, or always, when you're reading our research reports, it will differentiate. It will tell you which trials are with and without mulch. Um, and we can obtain, as I, I said, just as high as yields with um, or without mulch. How do you tackle an outbreak of botrytis? That is a good question. And um, I, I think you're you're going to have somebody speak here on diseases and pest management. Don't get desperate and and reach for something. This will be my advice. Don't get desperate and reach for something that is not approved for use in hemp. I will say that that's happened here in Vermont, um, and I get it. I'm a farmer too. I own a farm. Um, I've, li I've grew up on a farm. I know what it's like to feel that those moments of desperation in all different ways, but especially when you're about to lose a crop um, and you feel pretty helpless and it's money, a lot of money invested, time, effort, all those things. And um, yeah, uh, there are, you know, some products and with all of these, with everything, all the treatments really that are available for hemp, you need to be applying before you see botrytis. And maybe people are, um, but they're mostly preventative measures. So we have seen, I will say we've done trials with different fungicides. It's on my website, so go look at that. Um, Mill Stop, which is a, bi, a bicarb, bicarbonate material um, approved, it's approved here in Vermont for use on hemp. It may not be other places, but bicarbs have for us worked fairly well um, and for growers too. And they're approved organic and at least here they are approved in hemp. So, um, but you need to check with your state or you know whoever manages pesticides in your area. Um, what kind of spray rig did we use? Um, we have all kinds of different types of sprayers, but I like our, we have a small backpack air blast sprayer. So if you're growing on a small scale, it costs about $350. It does a really great job of covering the plants because it obviously can be really big. Um, it again, it's listed in our, our progress report online, um, the manufacturer and the sprayer, but it's, 
you know, it's gas powered. So, you know, it's heavy on your back. It holds about three gallons of material, but it can spray a really fine mist and you can get really excellent coverage on the plant. And then other than that, a lot of people are using um, like orchard sprayers um, in their hemp uh, for spraying. A um, harvest moisture and recommended storage moisture. Yeah, I, I didn't, um, I didn't get to that, and I'm not sure. Are you going to have somebody talking about that, Lewis? Sorry, I was keeping track of the Q and A. No, no, push. that's fine. Um, storage moistures. Are you going to have somebody uh, talking post storage? Uh, yes, yeah, so there will be a person talking about harvest and another person talking about processing. So that should be covered in the next yeah. sessions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we dry, I will say we dry down to 8%. I, um, I look at hemp as, you know, basically like, hey, I'm from dairy, dairy country, you know, so we produce a lot of hay. And if you're going to store hay for over a long period of time, it's got to be, um, around 8%. So just for that. Now let me, I think I answered everything there. Yep, that um, should be all. All right. Uh, well, thank you so much, Dr. Darby. Yeah, thank and I'm so sorry the, I see some people saying it was hard to, um, hard to hear and I apologize for that. It must've been my mic or my movement. Yeah, no worries. I mean, it will be recorded. Uh, I was able to hear you well, so hopefully in the recording, it will be better for all people. And uh, they can access it on the YouTube channel, the Cornell Sips YouTube channel. So not just this, but also past and future webinars. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thanks so much, Dr. Darby. It's a fantastic presentation. Uh, please join us in two weeks for hemp, <laughs> for pests in hemp, high cannabinoid hemp by Dr. K. Britt. Thank you so much. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.